You're listening to the Speaking Tongues podcast. I'm your host, El Sharice. Each week, I sit down to a conversation with multilinguals where we discuss and celebrate language, life, and culture through our own perspectives. Episode 95, Speaking Somali. Hello, language lovers. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Speaking Tongues, the podcast in conversation with multilinguals. This week, I'm joined in conversation by Sagal, the host of the Mem Noir podcast, to talk about her language of Somali. Sagal was so much fun to talk to, and I had a ton to learn from her. In this conversation, we talked about identity with language and how much it matters for language learners of color to see representations of themselves out in the world. We talk about French stereotypes and diversity in France and connecting to Somali culture in London. Sagal tells us about growing up in a Somali-speaking home while learning English out in the world. We talk about a story where she traveled to see her grandmother and being able to communicate with her grandmother in Somali. And we even talk about Somali grammar and orthography. We talk about Somali representation in London, including the one time of the year where you're likely to run into some big Somali celebrations. Big thank you to Sagal for sharing parts of your language and culture with all of us. If you enjoy episodes of the Speaking Tongues podcast, don't forget to subscribe, rate and review Speaking Tongues on Apple Podcasts and like and subscribe on YouTube so that other language lovers like ourselves can find the show. And if you've been a longtime listener of the show or even a recent listener, you can now support the show on buymeacoffee.com. Links to all platforms are in the show notes. Okay, let's chat. Welcome back to another episode of Speaking Tongues. I'm here today with Sagal. How are you today, Sagal? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm great. I'm so happy that we have this opportunity to talk. And thank you for making the time today to sit and chat with me. I like to start each episode with the same question, and that is, what is your first language and which languages have you learned to speak? So I would say my first language would be English or Somali, kind of. I think in between the two of those. And the other languages I've learned to speak is um, our French and Spanish and a little bit of oh, Arabic. Cool. A little bit of Arabic. Okay. That's yeah. quite, quite a few. How did, how did those languages come into the mix for you? Um, I, so, so my background, so my, I'm fa- my family is Muslim. So um, obviously the, the Quran is in, in Arabic as well. So from a young age, like, you know, it's really important to understand what, like, you know, what you believe in, right? So um and like what you're reading, right? So my mom would take us to like Arabic school when we were really young. Like, I, so like the good thing is now I know how to read and write in Arabic, um, so I can understand the Quran, and that's something that's really important to me. Um, and in terms of French and Spanish, um, I so in, in in the UK in England in general, um, we learn like specific languages in school. I think in the US probably like Spanish, right? In yeah. school we have the option between French or Spanish, and most people kind of learn French. Um, so I learned French like since primary school. So mm. like it's been something that's been like you know quite constant since pri- like so primary what do you, what do you guys call primary school like elementary yeah. school yeah elementary yes yeah, exactly yeah um <laughs> so it's, yeah since elementary school uh, I've been learning um, French and stuff and then I um I did it for um I'm trying to think of the equivalent for you <laughs> for American listeners but basically I did it when I was like so when you're in, when you're 16 you're taking you take an exam called GCSEs um. And for that exam, so, and you pick your, the school systems are so different. But I know. But let's just say, basically, I've been learning, I had been learning fr- uh, French since I got up to, like, um, university. And then from university, I decided to to study French as well. And Spanish um, comes into it because when I, w- when I started university, I was just doing French um, by itself, like a, French as a, ma- a major, with no minors. And I realized, well, let me just add another subject to it. So um, do, I did a French and, and Spanish degree for uni and then Somali because my family are from Somalia and you know they speak Somali we sp- well, I guess in the house they speak Somali mm-hmm. what yeah. made you decide to take on like a French major in school like why why major in a language when you get to so let's say 16 you have basically you have like the general subjects so the way our, our like school system works is um I guess it's so so different to yours but <laughs> you would um we have like what we call compulsory subjects so that's stuff like science maths english in my school because i went to a christian uh church of england school we did um re so religious religious studies um or religious education and 
we also did something called citizenship which is called like personal development it's basically let's say like to do with like the government i guess or like society so we had mm-hmm. to take those those were like compulsory module um like um, subjects and then we had something called options and so you have four options when you're in um when you're in um, secondary school so um or high school you have four four optional modules that you can uh, subjects you can pick and so i picked geography um history french and um PE we PE is physical education so sports yeah. basically mm-hmm. and so cool that's the when you're 16 so those you take an exam called GCSE at the end of at the end of our secondary school and then you go to something called college college is not what you guys call college our college is from the age of 16 to 18 so that's kind of yeah. like this I guess senior year I don't know what yeah. you guys call that junior it's like yeah. junior senior year yeah yeah, yeah, exactly. And so when you're in that stage, you you have like the choice of four subjects. You no longer have to do like compulsory or like you you have to pick four subjects, including the maths and the da da da. So from those four the four subjects I picked was biology, chemistry, um, French, and maths. So I picked those four subjects. I actually was going to do medicine as like my um degree for you know when I got to university but when I was like in the last year of college I kind of did like a whole 360 I realized I don't really want to go into medicine um I'm scared of blood number one (laughs) (laughs) so it wouldn't have worked also um I just realized I don't like the kind of the lifestyle um in the UK it's like the lifestyle that doctors have in the UK is really like really rigorous and also just like they have no work-life balance and I was like I'm trying to enjoy my life you know I don't want to be working all the time you know like that's not (laughs) that's not what I value like I don't really you know work is great but what I value is like you know having the time to for myself and that kind of stuff so I was like I don't want to do this um and then I just kind of thought about what what's been a constant thing that I've always loved and it's always been languages like even from a young age I remember like when I was in um when I was going to the Arabic school I mentioned when I was young um like my class was full of like you know I don't know Tunisians Moroccans Algerians I don't know, people from, I don't know, Saudi Arabia, all these other, like, all these Arab nations, and I'm, like, you know, an African Somali kid, um, and, like, I was getting top of my class. I don't understand how I was, so I was, like, <laughs> so, so clearly, like, languages have been something that I was, like, I'm really passionate about, and I have been quite good at from a young age, and so I just thought, like, this is the one constant thing I've loved, so I was, like, I just want to go for it, and so that's kind of why I decided to do French, and then, like I said, like, it was, like, the option of add something else to it, so I was, like, let me add Spanish because that's also another language that's like it doesn't make any sense when I say it but it makes sense in my head it's like it's been a it's been a subject or a language that I've always been interested in but I've never for some reason I I never felt like I could like me personally I could I could go and study it maybe just because the image of like I don't know someone who's studying languages is far far from what I am like you know when people do like when you see people doing language learning videos and stuff it's never you know a Somali African girl wearing hijab you know it's like it's you never see this type of images so it was just something I thought I was never allowed to do um yeah but then when I got to um yeah so when I got to university that choice was that like kind of I had that choice presented to me I was like why not and I ended up like loving it like that's you know I I love Spanish I'm so glad I made that decision so yeah that's basically how I kind of decided to do French or Spanish. I think I think that's really great. And I think that your story of saying like you didn't think that and I, I do understand what you're saying mm-hmm. when you say that. Like as a black American woman, I feel the same. Like I always love languages, but I never saw anyone who looked like me who was using mm-hmm. languages in their personal life, let alone their career. So it was like I didn't realize I could make a career off of learning languages or, you know, even spend the majority of my university years like studying it because the attitude was always like well what are you going to do with it and Mm -hmm. that's kind of how you know like you said earlier the the most popular second language that we have in the U.S. is Spanish and I wanted to learn French but you know there's no practicality for that here Mm -hmm. or so I was told when I was a kid and then also not seeing people who look like me was just like it was it was like no man's land. Like I wasn't like allowed to to participate and to learn that. So I totally understand what you mean when you say like, you know, you didn't think it was possible. But I'm glad that you actually stopped that narrative and you were <laughs> able to just to go for it and <laughs> and able to learn it. Yeah, um, definitely. I think when I got to when I started learning it because the thing so um the university I, I went to is called is called Queen Mary and it's like in East London and East London is like 
what's great about East London is it's a really diverse part of London, and so there's a lot of it's majority like quite um South Asian heavy. So there's a mm. lot of you know people from Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, and so. Uh, the campus was quite it reflected that quite a bit so there was a lot of people from Pakistan Bang- specifically I would say more most more so Bangladeshi people um, and so outside my classes it was like so diverse there's a lot of Africans of you know West Indian people a lot of different types of people um, and but then and a lot of Somalis as well um, but then when you when you when I got to my classes it literally was like a 360 my classes were I was literally like one of five or six black girls in my class so it was like a complete it felt like so different and it reminded it's kind of these things it's like it reminded me that you know you know for whatever reason it is languages are often or even the arts in general some things that are quite white you know full of white people basically in a sense like and it's most likely because of the fact that you know um other careers like engineering medicine law those type of things are careers that i guess a lot of parents who, who who come from and Africa, Asia, or whatever, they are more happy with their children to go into the degrees because a job is more, it's more likely for you to get a job out of that. Yeah. Um, so it makes a lot of sense why, but yeah, it was quite uncomfortable in my classes a lot of the time, um, f- knowing that I stand out so much. But at the same time, the reason why I like languages as well is because oh, even when I'm like kind of learning, this, going through the process of learning a language, I'm kind of connecting to like the communities that are like me that speak that language if that makes sense so for example mm. like what I love about France is not like you know typical white French culture what I really like about France is the African cultures within them and like how they kind of transform the language and it's so cool to like hear their slang and the way they speak and that kind of stuff that's what I love about it and then likewise with Spanish is so like the African culture within a lot of Spanish-speaking countries is beautiful and so that's kind of what I also am really attracted to as well. I completely agree with that and I think that it's amazing because I don't know about you in in London in the UK Mm -hmm. but I know here when we have any representation of something that's French it's really drilled down very specific it's very it's Mm. European French and it's very Parisian and Mm -hmm. it's very white and Mm -hmm. so you know for me even encountering you know black French speakers or you know um like African, like the mm-hmm. African Francophone people from, from mm-hmm. those countries. It just always blows my mind. Just like, where is this information? Like, why aren't we seeing more of this? 100%. And I think it's also down to like the media, the French media and how they present France. You know, they love that image of that, you know, white French person with the the little the hat that they have, whatever it's called. <laughs> the beret. The beret, and they love that image a lot. But I think, like, my kind of first... Obviously, like, France and the UK are really, really close to each other. But even still, like, a lot of people do have that image, even in the UK of, like, France being something that's quite... A country that's just... They, they don't, they're not aware of how much... um How diverse the country is. Because France, for example, in terms of, let's say, like, Muslims, let's say, France has the biggest Muslim population in Europe, like, more right. than the UK. Right. And with that, obviously, that's the, you know, West African Muslim communities, that's the North African Muslim communities, South Asians, that kind of stuff. And then we also account for that. So they also have a lot of, you know, non-Muslim West Africans, a lot of, you know, uh, people from all parts of the world. Because I think what's important to remember is that France, you know, they have a lot of history. I was going to say the big C word, colonization. You know, they have a lot of history <laughs> when it comes to, you know, colonizing countries all around mm-hmm. the world. So, you know, all of those communities that they, you know, all those countries and communities and cultures that they colonize have, you know, over time come and lived in France. So you have people from everywhere, and literally everywhere you can think of, you have people from West Africa, Central Africa, you know, East Africa, because so my, I'm, I told you my family's from Somalia, but Djibouti um, is a country like right next door that was colonized by France. And um, Djibouti used to, a part of it used to be part of Somalia, like, back in the day so it's like there's a lot of that community that live live in France as well and I think it's because I think I mean I guess it's slowly changing like I don't know if you watched um what's that called that show on Netflix oh Um, my favorite show Lupin Lupin yeah Lupin yeah exactly like that show is like I think a lot of people were shocked to see wow like there's actually you know black people in France but I was gonna say my kind of first um interaction with black French people black French culture was when I was in that college period I told you about 16 to 18 so when I was studying um French during that period we had um part of like the exam was also based on like uh, writing an essay and for the essay we watched a movie the movie was Latin you've probably heard of it it's a great it's a great film and for me it was like 
wow so all the stuff like all of the things that i know about black british ident- history and culture and whatnot is is found in also french black french culture and whatnot like the they have some of the worst like rates of um, um police violence in europe they have like it's, it's horrible like in terms of the history with that to this day um like i've basically the film is like a great example of like that kind of idea of the melting pot like of all the cultures that have come to france including you know black cultures and whatnot and um it was it was crazy to see and i remember like at, during that same period of time i had gone to france for like a trip with school and um i went to the north of of um of france the, in a like a town called rouen spelled r-o-u-e-n Mm-hmm. and um i was staying like with a, like, a, like a older french lady um and j- literally the week i was there there was a riot going on and the riot was about um a, a young um, black guy who had been um physically abused by the police um so and, like it, it was i was literally in the middle of it and it was in my head it was like I was like, so the things I'm learning in in class, like when I was back in in the UK, like and because I remember we were studying about so the police in um in in France they are allowed to have guns and that kind of stuff, which in the UK we don't have guns, right? So it was like I was learning about that and the riot police, and you see it in the film that we we're studying, and then I saw it in real life, and I was like, wow, like this is this is the reality, and it's not this film was made in the 90s, right? And this is the current reality for them. Yeah. So I yeah I think like France has a great job of setting that image of Paris and you know that the, the Eiffel Tower and whatnot but the reality is far from it it's far far from it yeah oh boy <laughs> <laughs> even I feel like Americans have a perception of France that's not it as well especially like so I love James Baldwin but like the I guess the people's idea of you know him going to France and living there and it being like an amazing 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 thing but I think the, it's definitely the maybe it might be in the privilege of being American maybe is mm. why he was treated differently perhaps um, because it's that same time period that's the six the sixties right sixties seventies and whatnot so that same time period you know France was going through uh, Algeria was going through a horrible period of um, breaking free of French colonization and so that was like a horrible period and you also have um, I can't remember the exact date but it was in France where there was um, protests um, anti anti colonial process happening in in Paris again um, um, against Algeria the colonization of Algeria and you had like mm. massive protests going on and you had police who were literally like abusing people and like there's this it's quite hidden in history but they um, they threw like dead bodies into the River Seine and like they oh still haven't I know and there's and and a lot of people are still fighting for recognition and I think in like 2010 or those t- that, like around that time um, they apologized for it so it's like so much hidden history it's like you know, France is not how we think of France, if right. that makes sense. Yeah, no, I totally get it. And this is the kind of stuff that's being purged and being brought to light in the last, you know, in recent years, which I think is, I think is really important because if we don't mm-hmm. acknowledge it, like we're bound to repeat it. So definitely. Um, yeah. Can we talk about Somali? Yes. Since you grew up in the UK and you're in London, um, what mm-hmm. were some ways that were easy in some ways that were challenging for you to stay connected to the language Mm, that's a good question um i think what was easy was that there's there's a lot of somalis in in london like there's quite a big community here and in in a lot of different parts of london as well um which is so it's like you know it's quite easy in t- like at times to feel connected to your culture there's a lot of Somali restaurants we have something called Somali week at the end of our Black History Month which is in October and so there's like I went to it like um the past October and it was like it was so cool there was like Somali there was like books in Somali that were like they were selling books that kind of stuff there was a play going on there was like events around like Somali identity that kind of stuff so it was really it was really really cool and I think I think Somalis are, do a quite a good job of like you know, forming communities and like protecting each other and trying to like revive the culture, that kind of stuff, which is good. I think what's difficult is that growing up, I didn't grow up in a Somali area or mm. to be honest, I grew up in a white area. So um, it was quite hard for me to, especially growing up, I was quite like, you know, ashamed of my culture. I was quite like, you know, embarrassed because, you know, when you're, when you're young, you don't want to stand out, right? You don't, you want to you know, fit into everyone else. And so when I was going to school, like I remember we were like the only Somali family in the area for quite a while so you know and especially because my name is very very Somali so I stood out like really really like there's names for example so my oldest is called Sarah so her name is quite you know Hebrew Arab, Arabic origin so it's like you know and a lot of white people have that name a lot of all cultures really have the name Sarah yeah, or Sarah yeah. um but 
for her um, so for me it was different because like well my name is so clearly different and I remember like just hating my name growing up I remember just being really ashamed of my culture basically um because yeah because you want to fit in right and so even for example when I was at school it was a thing of because my mum um my mom's obviously um didn't speak English um it was a thing of mum was learning English from us so like mm. we were speaking English at home all the time so that's that was the hard side it's like trying to fit in and trying to you know do well academically because you know obviously English is important you know um but at the same time trying to you know, retain to a culture it was like growing up one had to go and Somali was the one that had to go so I kind of focused on English and you know obviously I speak I born in the UK whatever but still like you're still behind your parents don't speak English because I remember like there was a ages ago we have so we have a channel here called channel four and they, they do like really cool documentaries and stuff and i remember ages ago there was a documentary about like um i guess what you guys would call kindergarten we call it nursery and about like the ki- uh, difference between like kids and from different eth- ethnicities and backgrounds and um the main thing i took away from that which was really interesting is like kids whose parents don't speak english um at home are like way behind kids whose parents do and so you're those kids are having to do catch up and I feel like I was doing that I was having to catch up mm-hmm. when it comes to vocabulary when it comes to like just because those for example even I feel like to this day the way my mom would say a word is still in the back of, like that I still have to correct it in my head like because that's how I would you know we're, we're learning from each other type you know so it was um it was weird but yeah it's it was hard but it got easier you know when mm-hmm. I got older and obviously could move around more good different places um also we moved from that area to another area which had a bit more Somalis in it um and also just me having more interest in Somali culture um and like being quite starting to become develop that cultural pride right so right. it got easier but it was definitely hard at the beginning well first of all I think your name is absolutely gorgeous <laughs> and I I really do because I love names that are like I love names that are just like your name has like gravitas and i love it like i love like Thank women's you. names that have like it's like oh okay like that <laughs> to me like that's a name you know like i love it um but secondly <laughs> i want to ask you um so you were your your mom was speaking somali at home and mm-hmm. you were you were learning english out in the world at and and you did say that somali had to go but do mm-hmm. you did you at all like how do I say, like, did your mom want you to keep speaking Somali? Did she encourage you? She, did she discourage you? Did mm. she want you to learn English in a way? Like, how was that? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, um, I don't think she, she never, mom, mom was not the type to like, disc- I think mom was quite very proud of her culture, um, which is lovely because like, to this day now she's like she shows me like you know old videos and she's all I don't know po- Somali, in Somali co- culture poetry is like it's a big thing so she'll show me like these long poems and like break it down and stuff like that so she's she loves the culture and that's kind of how I developed cultural like pride through her but I think growing up it was a thing of she was struggling to you know make ends meet she was struggling to um you know um yeah make ends meet and she was struggling herself like she was going Amber like we were, were going into so our our primary or our yeah our primary school was opposite our house so it was like, super close and right next door to our primary school was a like a college for adults so she would be going into the college to do English and math classes and we'd be going into primary school like so she was going through her own like quite like difficult like you know her own processes of her trying to like better herself that kind of stuff because she came to the country when she was I believe 21 or 22 and she had my eldest brother like soon after so you know she has her own dreams and hopes and that kind of stuff and it was quite difficult raised you know I'm one of six so you can imagine and um yeah and for like when I got like so my parents don't live with each other anymore anymore um and so it was like around the time when I was finishing primary school where like you know they separate that kind of stuff so it was really like a thing of her trying to have her trying to do stuff herself right so when you have all these worries bills da, 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 it's hard for you to you know to have your hands on everything and to be you know in control of everything and so I think just naturally it was a thing of um we just start to speak Somali less and less and less and we just start speaking English in the house also Heike I think for her it was it was quite good that we were speaking English to her because now her English is great so mm. Um, I, I, it's not something I'm like I'm angry about. I think I'm, I quite understand like that's the way it was, and I think now the great thing is like we have the opportunity, like we have the opportunity not to, uh, we have the opportunity now to go and learn Somali. Like you know, we're capable. You know, thank God. You know, we have a brain that works, we have a mouth that works, <laughs> we can go and learn. So as you're as you've gotten older and you're learning the language, um, how have you actually 
I guess, gotten back into learning Somali? Mm. And what are some of the methods that you've been using to, yeah. to try and, you know, pick it up again? Mm -hmm. I think the hard thing with Somali is not like, for example, French or Spanish or Arabic or even Japanese, where there's so many resources. It's a thing of like, there's quite limited resources and... um yeah it, it takes like a process you have to actively 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 try to look for resources and try to want like you need to want to learn it basically so what I kind of I found like online resources like so there's like a um it was like a Somali grammar book I found online like a pdf was like 200 pages <laughs> um I downloaded it um uh, and um I will start to go through it but I think it's a thing of it's hard being consistent when you're the when you're like it's hard being consistent when you don't have anyone to be accountable to. Um, mm -hmm. So that was quite difficult. But the good thing is I found um, Somali classes, which I'm in the third week of doing, and they're going great. They're going amazing. Yeah, I, lo I love it. I feel like it's like, as much as like I, I try to connect with my culture in other ways, like, you know, I love Somali music. I love Somali food. Somali food is beautiful. If you ever have, if there's, a, if there are, I don't know, um, Somali restaurants in, in New York or whatever, please go and eat Somali food like it's beautiful there's um, one in Harlem and I'm dying to try it <laughs> <laughs> please you will you will not be disappointed it is so good um but yeah it's like I love the culture I love the food I love I love the communities and stuff but as much as I can you know try to connect in those ways kind of like not speaking the languages or not speaking it well has always been something that's like I, f I, f I felt like you know not ashamed about but I felt like kind of upset about in a way um, yeah. so it's really I don't know I, f I feel amazing after every class I'm like oh, I'm s I feel so happy because <laughs> I'm, like, I'm getting closer like I'm learning things I'm like okay so when my mom says this that's why she's saying it like the thing is with my parents like or my mom like you can't um unless you're like I guess you've learned language in the past or you're really like into grammar for you to then explain a concept it's not it's not easy right I think it's right. only because I learn I've learned languages I understand okay cool subordinate clauses or da 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 or you know subject object pronoun all this kind of stuff it's because mm -hmm. I've learned languages and grammar structures I know what it means but I think for someone who's not like interested in in grammar structures or da 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 for her then to explain like oh yeah the reason why we say this rather than this she, it would be quite difficult so yeah, yeah having a teacher for that is really easy and it makes yeah it makes sense like I remember um before so the lesson started in January what what yeah January yeah and um, in December I went to see my grandma she lives in Saudi Arabia and she only speaks Somali like no English no Arabic no nothing <laughs> so um, and I had started like kind of that journey of learning Somali in like I would say October time so I was using the book that the, the, the you know the PDF I printed out and was you know trying to learn things and make notes and stuff and the cool thing is when I went there I remember um I made a mistake with something and my mom corrected me because mom was there as well um and in my head I was like oh that that's that that's that exact lesson I learned in the grammar book and so things started to connect and make you know it was yeah it was a, it was a nice experience and even whilst I was inside whilst I was inside with my with my um, nan it was a good experience of like just having to speak like you have to, like there's no other way of communicating and so it's like my grandma was super old as well she is 80 I want to say 80 four or five uh no no no. she's definitely six or seven yeah she's older than 85 but um she's super old so it's like i'm you know making the most of the time um so yeah i think it's, she it's must have been active. so happy to <laughs> she talk was, to you she, <laughs> yeah i definitely think she was she was even su i surprised them all none of them knew i was gonna join them oh so mom God. had gone er yeah my mom had gone earlier like uh, two weeks beforehand and i was like wait i just got paid you know money comes and goes like I maybe broke after this but let me just go and, and visit her you know like you can't guarantee when you know with life you can't guarantee things right so I was like let me just go and I joined and she was so surprised she started crying she's like wow da, da, da. and yeah I feel like it was it was such a nice time because my grandma's like she's like love storytelling so we're just sitting with her you know hearing her stories and like learning things I brought a little like a notebook with, uh, with me and so I was literally writing down words new words that I learned and so it was nice because my grandma also speaks like really like I would say really like not formal but like pure in a way somali like it doesn't mom speaks somali with a lot of english words um <laughs> so like for example i don't know it's, yeah she wouldn't say the word for i don't know a, a lot of the um the, the word i'm thinking of, for example is development she might say da -da -da -da, development or like you know those big words are like that are that you can find an english word for she'll just use those words whereas my grandma will, will use the the proper proper word for things mm. um so it was that was a nice experience i definitely learned a lot do you remember what the first word or phrase was that you said to your grandmother when you surprised her? Oh, wow. What did I say? Um, <laughs> I think I just said to her, like, so 
she, I came in the room and she was like, who's this? And I was like, hey, what, Sagalwaiye. Sagalwaiye means it's Sagal. Uh, she's like, what? Who's this person? And I was like, and she was like, no, it can't be you. It can't be you. <laughs> and she just started crying and I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. such a joyful thing that you were able to do. And like, you'll always yeah. remember that, you know, like such yeah. precious time with your grandmother. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. <laughs> tell us some things that you're learning currently as you're, you know, you're starting this, this course and, um, you know, you're loving it. What are, like, where are you now? What are mm. you learning? Teach us some stuff. Yeah. Wait, let me get my, where's my book? So, um, the one thing I was like quite surprised at is, well, not really surprised at, but it, it made things easier is that uh, just like French and Spanish, Somali has genders for everything. And so objects will have genders, whereas in English, we don't have that. Even things about like, so one thing, like one lesson that I was like, wow, not wow, but I was like, oh, that makes, that's quite interesting is like, you know, like point, he called it pointers. So things like this or that, or those or these, those or these and this and that, they all have genders. Like in, like in French, actually, you know, I've set and you have so, um, like, and, and well, yeah, so what was really interesting is that we also have that in Somali. Everything has a gender. I think English is quite like, English is, is hard. I guess it is hard for someone learning it, but it's also quite, it's also quite a basic language in a way. Like it doesn't have that complexity with genders and that kind of stuff that a lot of other languages have. So that was quite mm-hmm. cool to learn. Like, okay, when you're saying this cup, you have to say, the, you have to find the gender of what you're saying and then you have to add the specific, the female version of it rather than, the, you know, feminine and masculine versions of things. So that was quite interesting to learn. But it's really like starting off with like making sure our basics, like our, our, we're very much like our foundation is good and then like building up on it, which I think is really useful. What's also, the, so the thing I've always struggled with Somali is like when it comes to um, like verbs. So the thing is when, it, so I can understand Somali quite well. The hard thing is about like having to reply, right? And so mm. part of the reason why this is difficult is because I'm having to think of, you know, grammar and like it's quite hard to to learn grammar by yourself so it's quite it's really useful that he's breaking it down and like like with other languages you know the pronouns are quite actually quite similar to the french or spanish pronouns you have you have i you have you plural you singular then you have she or he we don't really have it like a um the it is either has to be it's either feminine it or masculine it so it's either she or he um and then you have they and we so that's quite like i I honestly think it's really helpful when you're learning another language um that you've it's really, uh, how do I say this, it's really useful that I have a basis in languages because it makes it easier when I'm learning other languages. Um, I'm trying to think of something that I can... <laughs> something you can show off. Let's hear some, let's hear some <laughs> Somali. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of it? Oh, okay, this is, you know what, this is, this might sound so basic, but it's because like, I'm so used to it, so it's days of the week, right? But I'm so used to um, just saying like, Monday, Tuesday, da 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 So... And I would hit like yeah, um, and I would hear, um, and I think also my mom just says Monday, Tuesday, da da da. But um, what was interesting is our days of the week is um, they have um, a bit of um, Arabic influence, so which is really mm. cool. So to say Monday, you said Isnin, Tuesday is Talado, Talado, yeah. Wednesday is Arba'o, Arba'o, yeah, Thursday is Khamis, Khamis, yeah, Friday is Jim'o, Jim'o. Yeah, Saturday is Sabti. Sabti. Yeah, and Sunday is Ahad. 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 Yeah. Oh, there's a stop in there. <laughs> Ahad. Yeah. So okay. it's it's got a lot of the similar sounds to Arabic in terms of like mm-hmm. that hate the he- the heavy H the hat. Um, but the thing is, so for example, Ahad in Arabic, Ahad is one, right? And so you know, in a lot of cultures, the week starts from um, in my head, it starts from Sunday. So it's like. Sunday is the first number, so Ahad in Arab in Arabic is one, and we say um, Ahad is Sunday for us, so one, and then Isnin is similar to Arabic Ithnain, Wahid Ithnain, Ithnain is two in Arabic, so it's like Tuesday. Um, Talado is Wednesday. Talado is similar to Thalatha in Arabic. Thalatha is three, so it's like if an uh, Arba in, in Arabic is four, and our mm-hmm. Wednesday is Arba. So it's like you can see it's quite similar. Interesting. Um, yeah. I think there's definitely um, ways of saying this in um, in other dialects. I'm sure this is kind of like I guess the standard, but because um, Somali was colonized by Italy, we all ha- also have a lot of Italian influence in the words we say. And so, for example, the one clear example because it's also in Spanish is to say bag in in um, Italian in Somali is borso. 
Italian is the same, and in Spanish is bolsa, right? So, yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a lot of like influence and stuff. Um, yeah. <laughs> How interesting! I forget about that Italian colonization connection, and I guess, huh? I didn't even think that there would still be connections there, but mm-hmm. it's interesting that there are. Well, that's really cool. I'm glad that you're. I'm glad that you're enjoying. And what? I guess. I mean. Doesn't matter because it is what it is. But like, what level are you? Did you start at beginner? Did you jump into kind of like an advanced beginner? Um, I actually jumped into in- intermediate. Um, oh, yeah, I because my un- <laughs> it's not. I don't find it offensive at all. <laughs> Sorry, I don't find it offensive at all. Um, you know, language learning is a process, right? It is what it is. You you know. Um, but yeah, so he the way it worked is actually the first lesson it was like kind of conversation, and so he was asking like you know how are you da da da, and I was you know responding um, in my broken way, um, and you know he got me to write out sentences, and he was uh, making me read out passages and that kind of stuff. So my reading, I think my reading is somebody's quite decent, um, and my writing as well, which is cool. But the easy, the great thing about Somali, the writing, like the writing system, is that it actually uses English letters or Latin letters, so it's quite similar to English. The only difference is that to make that like ah sound, so we have for example, in the, one of the words I gave you was Jim'ah, which is Friday. The, there's a uh, there's like a like a uh, like a in Arabic it would be called Ain. Uh, in yeah. English we call yeah yeah. So it's that sound. For us to to the way you would write it in in our script, we use the letter C. So the word Jim'o, which is Friday, would be spelled J I M C O. Oh, yeah. But you so. still have to use that like kind in the yeah. word when you say it. Yeah. Okay. And likewise with uh, Sunday was Ahad, right? So it has a hat sound. We in our language we use X to show that. Oh, cool. Yeah, so it's Latin, but with a little, you know, difference. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so exciting. I didn't want to make the assumption that there was a correlation with Arabic and Somali, even though mm-hmm. geographically it seems like there would be and there should be, but I didn't want to make that assumption that there was. So, like, but I think it's really great that like it's similar, but it's different. Yeah, I I would say like it's um. I think I use Arabic as like an example because I think quite a lot of people are familiar with Arabic, like the language. But I think it's because Somali and Arabic are both Afro-Asiatic languages, right? So they have similarities, even though Somali is part of the Cushitic branch, whereas Arabic is part of the Semitic branch alongside Amharic, um, you know, it's language both in Ethiopia and, and also Hebrew. Mm. Um, and so because it's part of the same language family tree, it's quite similar. But there's a lot of differences, I think. Um, there's, there's some sounds that are different as well, like, for example... Arabic don't have so for example the one thing I used to like when I was young I used to like be quite frustrated about is in Arabic you can't really write my name because so my so sagal it's like a they they don't have that kind of g sound in Arabic mm. so it would either be pronounced sakal or sakal which is not my name so so they, there's some sounds that they have that we don't that we have that they don't have so it's similar but it's different I think the yeah. similarities also come from like the religion, right? So both like a lot of Arab countries are also Muslim countries, and a lot and Somali is a Muslim country as well. So the some of the similarities and influences come from trade, come from religion, that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's and it's also quite close to each other. Like you know, Yemen is not far at all, and historically Yemen and Somalia have had the connection for quite a while. Like they have True. the same, a lot of the same foods that we eat, they eat there as well. Even some of the same like dress, like um um. For example, we have something called ma'awis. Ma'awis is what men wear. It's like a, it's not a skirt. I would say it's like a like a um, material that men wrap around their waist, and it's like quite you know different patterns and stuff. We call it ma'awis. They also have it in Yemen. They call it ma'awis as well. We eat, for example, um, in Ethiopia it's called injera. Mm-hmm. In Somali we call it angelo, but ours is not as sour. Um, and in Yemen they call they also eat angelo as well. So it's like there's a lot of similarities within that region in general. And the coffee, I bet. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. We we have coffee as well. I think your favorite is definitely like more known for, but we have coffee as well. Oh man! So you said earlier that there is a there's a big community of Somalis in London, and mm-hmm. that you have a whole week of celebrations. First of all, what goes on during those <laughs> celebrations? I want to go. <laughs> it's so cool. It's um it's organized by a group called Cade. 
K-A-Y-D. Um, and so it's just like a celebration of Somali, you know, music. They have like, they had like a Somali concert going on. So like there's um, a massive uh, Somali artist. He's like from Somalia, Somali like grew up and raised there. His name is, what's his name again? Um, I have his, also his name is Sultan Serar. Um, and he came down to London to perform and it was like packed, like British Somalis, all types of Europeans, everyone came, was watching, it was packed. Uh, he's got great songs. <laughs> um, so they have like music, so celebrating Somali music, celebrating Somali culture. They had a play going on by written by a British Somali playwright. Um, they had like like book signings, that kind of stuff. It was really cool. I think it's I think it's been running for like I would say maybe like at least more than five years now but it's I, I don't know I just love seeing things celebrating Somali culture because growing up there was a lot of like especially when I when I was in school there was a lot of like hostility towards Somalis um and like that's kind of why I felt like I mentioned I felt quite ashamed of being of my culture when I was growing up because it was quite difficult being different um and so you know it's lovely now that instead of some lots of Somalis feeling shame and embarrassed about the culture now it's kind of flipped and people feel really you know pr- proud of their culture there's so much pride and it's beautiful to see from my end but there's definitely a lot of Somali stuff happening in, in, in like London like there's a like I said there's a lot of different Somali communities I would say the main when I think of like Somalis in London the main areas I would say Shepherd's Bush that's in West London you have Halsden Halsden's in North West London um what else do I say Shepherd's Bush Halsden and um yeah, I'll say those are the two main. I'm trying to think. There's def- the thing is that they're well, literally we're everywhere. Like everywhere you go in London, you'll see a Somali. <laughs> it's the same with like I feel like Nigerians. Everywhere in London you go, you'll see a Nigerian. Everywhere in London you go, you see a West Indian. Like we're just we're everywhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How have you noticed that the culture or the language, um, Somali language or culture, has mixed with the British culture? Like, and I think in terms of language, like. You know, like similar to what we were saying about in France, how the, you know, the, the communities that are in France that are, that are not French and how they've been able to play with the language and shift and, you know, they've got the slang and they're probably mm-hmm. cooler than I will ever be <laughs> in my whole life. Um, but like how, how do, do you notice like how Somalis play with the language when it comes to speaking Somali and speaking English like mm. has a slang emerged has a like an underground way of speaking and communicating emerged from this cultural mix that's so cool I don't think I don't think that an underground like a new slang has emerged I think because we haven't been in the UK for too long like I think generally Somalis came in the 90s and stuff so we've only really been here for like what 20 30 years um but I would say definitely like I can see the impact of the Somali language in general, like UK slang or Somali culture in UK slang in general. Um, one thing is that like, if you go to London, you'll hear everyone say Wallahi, Wallahi. Like, and Wallahi means like, like I swear down or like I swear to God. Um, so I swear down is also another way of saying it's another slang. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, I swear, I swear, to, I swear to God. Um, so you will hear people say Wallahi, Wallahi, Wallahi. And that's because Somalis use Wallahi all the time. Like it's like a common thing, like, you you go to London and people are like oh you must be Somali because you use Wallahi like in every other sentence. I'm surprised I haven't used it already. <laughs> so feel free to def- throw it in. <laughs> <laughs> so it's definitely like I can see the impact and also like um, I think a lot, for example, a lot of um, the UK music scene, like you'll see people use Somali words here and there, which is so cool to see. Uh, so I mean, like it's really much people embracing Somali culture a lot more. I think um, in terms of like the way most Somali British Somali speakers like we use a lot of like Somali in English it's like some English I guess. now they have like Sp- Spanglish we have our own type of mix of that we will say you know English 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 Somali word da, da, da. like that's how that's how we speak at home actually to be honest like I'll say like mom will even to be honest she'll be like can you get me the baldi baldi is like um like the bucket the mop, mop and bucket you know um mm. yeah so she, she'll use random like she'll we will all use like English and then like a Somali word like I'll be like, oh, um, so and so, can you get me the cob? Cob is a cup. So it'd be like, oh, so it'd be like a mixture of like how English plus a bit of Somali, and I think a lot of speak people speak that way. Um, but yeah, I definitely see. I, I, what I love about London is is really, really much a, a, a melting pot, a, uh, a melting pot of different cultures. Um, and so I'm definitely starting to see Somali cultures, Somali words and stuff creeping in, which is cool to see. I think so too. And I think it's great because, um, you know, I've spoken to a few other people before who live in London or have lived in London and I've asked them about, 
I try to ask people, you know, when they when they are living in, mm-hmm. especially like a European city, like where do you see representations of your culture? Is mm-hmm. there like a parade? Is there a festival? Is there some mm-hmm. kind of like cultural awareness event that you know mm-hmm. is att- is well attended by your own people and also by you know everybody else so that they can also witness the glory of your culture so mm-hmm. i'm so happy to hear that there's so much representation of somali culture in london and like i had mm-hmm. no idea um <laughs> i really asked that question cuz i i didn't know and now i'm like see like the times i've been to london and like all the, the neighborhoods you've mentioned like i haven't been to them and i haven't been to mm-hmm. south london either which i'm like mm-hmm. I'm mad at myself that I've been in the <laughs> South London. Where have you been? <laughs> I've been like the center of London. Okay, like yeah. totally, totally tourist. And I've been to Essex. So mm. um, <laughs> that's, right, right. that's random. <laughs> super random. Um, but I, you know, I haven't, you know, I've only been to London maybe three times. So, mm-hmm. but I've, I've done just like the completely touristy stuff. Mm. And every time I'm there, I'm like, okay, so like my background is West Indian, so I know oh, there's cool. a ton of West Indians. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm always like, <laughs> "Where are you guys? Where is everybody?" You're in the wrong parts. If you went, if I'm you went South part. London, <laughs> I was say even actually one of the areas I went to Halston, that is like West Indian Central. Like there's so many Jamaicans in that part, so it's like there's. I feel like wherever you find one community, you'll find other ones around it. So like even when you go parts of South London, you'll find like, for example, like um. Um, Peckham is known to be like where you find a lot of Nigerians, but you also mm. find a lot of different af- other ethnic group, uh, other ethnic groups um, in those parts as well. So you should definitely check out. You should go to South London, hundred percent. That's where yeah. like Black British culture is. Like you find that, it, like you know, plenty. Um, I'm definitely prioritizing London again now after mm-hmm. we <laughs> after our conversation. <laughs> but I want to I want you to tell us about your podcast memoir. Mm. Um, tell us. Just kind of what you do and of course tell us where we can find you and how we can listen to your show yeah so memoir is a podcast i create actually on the bit on the back of coming back from my year abroad so i went to geneva in switzerland and madrid in spain um as part because as part of my degree i had because i studied languages of course and so you have to like go into a country to immerse yourself right and so i, p- I picked those two places but the issue was that i felt like i was really ill prepared and uh i remember before going i would like type in google like frantically like black girl goes to Geneva or you know the black experience and da 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 I'll be like Muslim because obviously like it's, I have two identities right obviously like I wear hijab but that's the first thing people see and I'm obviously black at the same time so it's like making sure like how would either or be perceived in each country and it was I didn't find many resources if I can be honest um and that made me feel really nervous and anxious like as as you would expect and so I remember like asking teachers before and like oh um you know how is this country like and them just be like oh it's gonna be fine don't worry don't worry and then unfortunately experiencing racism and Islamophobia in both places I went to oh, like no. I don't think I you do yeah it's a shame like it's a shame that it happened that way but that was that was like the case and I feel like if I was better prepared I would have felt like a lot more you know ready for things like that the thing that shocked me was it wasn't obviously you have stairs and that kind of stuff especially like Spanish people are heavy on staring um but like it was a lot of the times it was from P- um for example so I studied at the university there and in Madrid uh, and in Geneva and a lot of times the racism and all the ignorance was coming from teachers which I was not prepared for Mm -hmm. yeah which I was not prepared for at all so anyway so I created the podcast just to kind of like as a resource for people who are in my position who are all or just people in general who are going to live in another country for a long while and just want to understand how that experience is like and so basically on the podcast I interview guests who've gone to different places so far we've had um, Malaysia, Brazil, Argentina, Jordan, France, Belgium, Spain, um, Guadeloupe, Reunion. Um, so different parts of the world and they're all black and just about their experience traveling, like everything. Like it obviously there's not about like negative experiences about everything, just to like, for example, how easy was it to get around, you know, all the questions that we like someone may have before they go on a long trip. So basically, yeah, the the reason why I created it was basically as a resource. And so you can find it on like all the podcast streaming places. Spotify, um, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, everywhere. Uh, it's under Memnoir, so it's spelled M E M N O I R E. And the reason about the name was, I was like, "Oh, why'd you put the name Memnoir?" Memnoir is just literally a combination of two words, two French words. Memoir, it's really an English word as, as well. Memoir and noir. Obviously, noir means black. Memoir is like you know, uh, I don't know, like 
memories, experiences, you know, people often say like travel memoirs. So um, it's really just a, a, the experience, a collection of experiences and, and or from people, from black people who travel, basically. Mm-hmm. I hope that made sense. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And um, I, I'm i sorry that you had those negative experiences and you mm-hmm. definitely don't deserve them and no other Muslim person, you know, person with Muslim faith deserves that. Um, mm-hmm. It's deplorable, it's disgusting. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm really sorry that, that you happen to live through that experience. Mm-hmm. Um, I really applaud you for creating this podcast to be a resource for people because as we know, as, as Black people, we don't hear the stories often of people who mm-hmm. go abroad and it can be scary for a mm-hmm. lot of us and, and to, like you said, your other identity of being Muslim, like that's also really pertinent mm-hmm. in the world we live in, unfortunately, now. Definitely. You know, you can't just, you can't just be your best self without yeah. people <laughs> being jerks and I hate that. Um, mm-hmm. But thank you for doing this work to to create this resource and mm-hmm. and to, you know, to be there for people. So thank you. That what, means a lot. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, what I will do is add links to your show and to your socials in the show notes for this episode mm-hmm. so that people who um, want to listen after listening to this episode can <laughs> or while maybe you can interrupt me you can, you can interrupt <laughs> us and, and go listen to the memoir and um and then come back to this whatever you want to do but they can just do that right away <laughs> thanks thank you so much for this conversation i really had so much fun talking to you i'm so re-inspired to go back to london <laughs> and have somali food and when is this and this you said it's the last week of october which is british black history month so yeah maybe that's the time for me to go to london <laughs> at the end of october yeah. um but i really enjoyed this conversation with you this is so much fun <laughs> <laughs> likewise i really enjoyed it and i hope it's inspired someone who's also in my position who's you know maybe can understand their the native language or their mother tongue, but can't really speak a well mm-hmm. to go and start lessons and stuff because it's made me feel so proud and so happy. And yeah, yeah hopefully, hopefully I can say, you know, I know a couple months time that I'm, you know, I'm getting closer to, to fluency. Yes, that would be so, <laughs> you have to come back and tell us um, how, <laughs> oh. how, tell us, keep us, keep us um, up to date on your journey with Somali <laughs> and with your travels. So um I like to end each episode with the same question, and that mm-hmm. is, do you have any jokes, swear words, tongue twisters, cool slang words, idioms, words of wisdom, or words of advice in Somali to share? You know, I had to ask mom this question before I started, because I was like, I don't want to, you know, I want to make sure I come correct. Because you said <laughs> swear words, I had a lot, but I was like, that's not the, I, that's not the vibe I want to <laughs> 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 Um... I guess I have two. Um, one is something that I found on Twitter, which is really cool. I saw it ages ago and I was like, oh, this is really relevant to the podcast. Um, the first one is Dekta Ayaka Dat Wayne Isha, which means that your ear is older than your eye. And I think it's a reflection of, yeah, it's a reflection of our oral culture, right? So, um, like I said, Somali is heavy on like, um, imparting knowledge orally speak you know you would sit down with your elders they would tell you stories about your family and in our culture as well we like we remember our names we're taught our names of like going back so for example I can't I'm not the, I can't remember it properly but like my my name is made up so my it's not like I think in a lot of cultures or in English cultures you have a family name that continues right we mm. our name is dynamic it changes all the time so my name is Sagal Omar Abdullahi um and so Omar is my or Omar Omar is my dad is my dad's name. Abdullahi is my granddad's name, and my dad's. And so it would change. For example, my dad's name is Omar Abdullahi Hirsi. Hirsi is his grandfather's name. And so oh. uh, from a young age, you're taught all of your names going back. So some people can name like seventeen generations going back, and it's taught to you. Like mom's name, I think I know mom's one better. Than mine, mom's name is um, Fahan Fahan Bihi Sofi Magan Abdullah. And it keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. Wow. <laughs> so yeah, that's it's. I think it's something that's so unique about our culture. Like um, poetry is something incredibly big. Like, and what would happen is you would have like these um, two tribes who were like you know warring, whatever, and they would bring their best um, poet and they would battle like a rap battle in a sense. How you have it in you know 
currently <laughs> and mm-hmm. so like yeah it's a like yeah I think it's it's quite special um because I think things that are written down are sometimes more valued than things that are spoken um so yeah that's that's one really cool one I found um yeah and the other one I found my well, mom told me about just before I started is mm-hmm. um which means your heart sees more than your 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 eyes yeah so I think that's about like your intuition you know the feeling that you know what your eyes see is not always maybe what the truth is yeah um can you teach me one of them <laughs> your choice <I'll, laughs> which one did you prefer I'll teach you the one you preferred <laughs> no I think they're both gorgeous um let's let's do the one that your mom told you because yeah. we love mom and <laughs> and she's you know she's mom so let's do let's do mom's Cool. So it's indaha. Indaha. Yeah. Kalbika. Kalbika. Ka. Ka. Egma. Egma. Fug. Fug. Yeah. So indaha. Kalbika. Indaha. Kalbika. Ka egma fug. Ka egma fug. Yeah. So inda, your eye as your eyes. Kalbi is your heart. So the way it's like structured is like the other way around. It's like your eyes, your heart is yeah, sees more. <laughs> so it's, yeah. Very cool. Thank you for teaching me that. That's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and thank Welcome. your mom for me. <laughs> <laughs> I will. <laughs> well, thank you again for this conversation. Um, like I said, I had a great time chatting with you. Before I let you go, really quickly, Let's say we're in London. Let's say we're at this like Somali restaurant or we're at like the week long festival or something. And we're, you know, we've been talking, we've been chatting. And after all this time, um, what is the best way to say goodbye in Somali? Oh, that's like what I think what a nice way is saying. It's like, a, it's like saying nice to meet you. You can say barasho. Barasho. When accent. One accent. Yeah, that means like nice to meet you. And so I think that's a nice way of, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's nice. But but I show one accent. Yeah. But, oh, your pronunciation is great. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> I hope not to get like cancelled by like all of Somalia. But I'm trying. <laughs> I, I, hope I'm, I hope I'm, you know, making you proud at some point. But... <laughs> No, your pronunciation is really good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I will be talking to you soon. Cool. (laughs) Bye. Bye.